architecture has a mission. This mission is to be at the service of the public. That's why it's called architecture, which is equivalent to art, as important as art, but it's architecture. It's a, it's a, it has its own definition of what it can do and how it should evolve. So when you look at architecture in the service of the people, then a program, a functional program, will never be enough. Because you're portraying certain experiences into the eyes of the public that they will not recognize. They are used to hot and cold water. It's fine. Mix it and you have mild, wonderful, warm, not too hot, not too cold water. So what you're doing is you're bringing elements of subjectivity into an objective experience. By doing that, you have to follow certain specific rules. One of them is accessibility. Another one is uh, uh, horizontalness. Another one might be generosity. A fourth one could be intimacy. A fifth one could be interactive. And when you start mixing these elements, the typologies of architecture that we bring out of our own political system, our democracies, is a more engaging with the public architecture that provides all of these issues. So the reason why we introduce more than the program into the buildings is simply because architecture has a larger mission than just to fulfill the program. It is a cultural statement in our time which is representing our state of consciousness. And if we don't move that forward every time, who else is going to do it? It is within the task and the contract with society that architecture has to develop this issue further. Otherwise we don't change. Otherwise we can't experiment. Otherwise we cannot enhance our knowledge base. We don't become intuitive, not associative. So we need to take all aspects of human reflection into the physical shape of architecture. Then you let them walk on the roof. Or you let them have a free accessible plaza in a place where restrictions on security are very high. What happens in Alexandria? They hold their hands and protect the building because it was accessible. It belongs to them. Yes, it is an experiment, it is strange, but it belongs to the public and they protect whatever uh, belongs to them. We, we work along lines that are on one hand intuitive, on the other hand, they're based on a deep desire to try to reflect on any type of task that is coming along where you have the possibility of change. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the conflict between East and West is a massive conflict. Many people would criticize us for working in Saudi Arabia because it is a dictatorship, because it has a kingdom that doesn't allow equality between men and women. What do we do? We go in and help the forces that want to liberalize emancipation. So, architecture has a political message which helps develop the forces that are working in direction of human rights, that are working in direction of increased democracies, emancipation and relationships to the human public. Same thing we're doing with the very small projects. They are maybe just injections, very tiny small injections in certain small places, but they help people locally who are not used to travel to the big cities and go into the big opera houses or look at the big museums to enhance their own opinion of how these things can be experienced. They see, the public sees, that you can even make a difference with very, very small things. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, fishing museum at Kamei, which by the way is my home island, is where I come from, uh, they wanted a, a fishing museum uh, which uh, describes the history of fisheries from the first uh, motorized uh, boat and up until today. There was another museum for the time before motors, only with sails and fisheries. But they wanted something that was simple and direct, but had no money. No money whatsoever. So we started a fundraising campaign in the local community, and we develop a building typology which only has one profile. It's like a square pipe. 
And we say, and we know exactly how much each meter length uh, of this building is costing us. So we would have a barometer in the local community uh, town hall, which would show the money that comes in, equalizing the length of the building. Today, it only became one centimeter lo longer. Uh, the day before, one meter longer. And tomorrow, maybe two meters longer. Until we had a sequence of possible production lines at a very low cost with local involvement where then the people also helped us in all traditional fashion to build certain elements of the building. They could follow the economy. We call it the sausage uh, model. You buy as much sausage as you can afford, basically. But it became very, very cheap and very, very beloved building, although it is not applying to any of the building traditions of the region. It's a concrete building in a wooden architectural environment. So the location of the horizon where the building cantilevers and leans on the horizon, the precision of how you put it into the landscape became the effects. And by having young people following a museum like that from the very beginning through the different processes all the way until you cast the concrete, you put in the glass, you move in the exhibitions, is a, is a great experience. It goes over a short period of time. You're involved in the local community. You're involved with the design. You're involved with the choice of materials and how you actually cast. You even uh, can test the cantilevering of concrete walls. So in a way it's sophisticated, but at the other hand, totally unplugged, we call it. It's unplugged architecture. It's playing music without uh, uh, any kind of artificial speakers or you know, digitalized music. Times Square is a very important place in New York. It has for a long time been occupied by cars. Uh, the city, New York, needs to own this space for its inhabitants and for its visitors. It's one of the most visited places on Earth in, in density, in, in celebrations of New Year. It, is, it has an enormous amount of visitors every year. Now, when you open up a space, when you remove the traffic, when you go and try to give a public space like this back to New York, it's quite obvious that it's not uh, a bottom-up process. If you ask a taxi driver, he would never agree. If you ask uh, you know, people driving a car, they wouldn't agree. It's not a bottom-up process because the involvement is too large, the impact is too big. And by the way, it's not that iconic. It's kind of low-key because it's really only the ground and the benches and the, the, the things that you get in intimate uh, contact with. But once that has been achieved, we believe that you can use this space in a different manner, which also means that you think of other things. You know, if, if you have to walk along a street, we have to watch out for the cars driving over you all the time. Then, then your mind is focused on this situation. If you change the perception of the place, by putting new obstacles, for instance, in front of you, meaning you have to move differently through that space, then all of a sudden you think differently. Your mind is set differently, your eyes move differently. So that movement and that perception of that space then becomes the ownership or is laid into the hands of the public in how they actually experience this space. Whereas, for instance, the benches in Guatemala City is a totally different approach because it's a bottom-up process. You involve artisans, you involve people and look at their specific and basic needs to the extent that we had to find an object that could squat the sidewalks. We actually locate a bench so the cars cannot park. It needs to be heavy, it needs to be sturdy, but it's still a piece of art so that the people can actually have the sidewalks for themselves, not for everything else. So that, in a way, is a squatting, uh, uh, which means occupation, you know, when people move into buildings and they squat them, uh, kind of activity. Uh, so also the process and who you work with is different. Uh, Times Square has all the procedures and the ways that you get the approvals and go all the way down, all the way through. In Guatemala City, we were asked uh, to do anything we wanted 
and we chose the sidewalks. And we created these benches with local uh, artisans and artists to prevent the sidewalks mm -hmm. from being used by others than those it belongs to. So yeah, you could say there are two different processes completely, but they have some of the same objectives. And uh, that means there isn't only one way to roam, there are many ways to get to where you want to get. And sometimes you have to use bottom-up processes and involve a larger group of people. Sometimes you have to go through the decision procedures that are coming from top down. There is not one solution, but you have to adapt the solution to be contextual. The process must be contextual, as the architecture is contextual, as every way of thinking is contextual, as a landscape in itself provides you with the conditions that you have to sort of uh, re rely on, but also fight in architecture. The same thing happens for the process. The process is as contextual as a landscape. 